in the humanities. I'm David Bromwich, one of the organizers of the conference, and I want to begin by acknowledging the support of two institutions whose generosity made it possible. The Humanities Program at Yale, chaired by Brian Garston, and the Carnegie Foundation, which allowed me to use fellowship funds for this purpose. Uh, we owe more particular thanks to Ben Barash, a postdoctoral fellow in humanities, for helping give shape to the conference and taking charge of the correspondence and coordination over several months, and to Aaron Townsend, Madison Capabianco, and Katie Taylor for administrative work and technical help they've given and will continue with uh, over these next two days. Just a couple uh, notes about the order of things in this program. Um, first of all, there's a, a correction to the um, the bulletin listing the titles of papers that was sent out. Uh, Jonathan Lear's talk on the second panel uh, is now entitled, uh, When Megan Married Harry, a comment on the humanities. Um, that change of title came in just a bit too late for us to change it on the information we were sending out. So we're going on uh, the following pattern. Um, in panels and lectures. Uh, there is a speaker or speakers in the case of panels and a respondent who is also the moderator. Uh, the respondent will make a comment on what the presenter or presenters have said and then will be in charge of calling on people in the audience. Um, if you have questions for any of the speakers, uh, we ask you to use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen uh, and uh, it, it, to ask it aloud. Um, and then have your video on while you're asking your question. Uh, and I should say uh, in general, uh, and this is just out of politeness, a sort of fiction. Um, if you're not shy as Plotinus was of having your picture taken, um, keep the video on to, to induce uh, and increase the, illusion of presence that speakers like to have, but we understand concerns of privacy. Um, and uh, uh, if, you, if you want to black it out at any time and for any reason, obviously that's okay too. But far more important, please stay muted uh, during the presentations. And if you have any other uh, tech question, submit it on chat and uh, our very uh, experienced uh, and savvy assistance will try to help you. <clears throat> the people here old enough to remember the humanities of the 1990s will recall the frequency of colloquiums devoted to big theme topics like uh, disciplinarity or the making of traditions or what is a text. There have been few such discussions in the humanities lately and if one asks why, one cause may be the growing importance of the cover term culture. Culture understood in a sociological and anthropological sense, a way of defining all the phenomena of knowledge whose ambition sometimes seems to encompass not just the humanities, but the social sciences and much else besides. Along with that overarching emphasis, which goes under many other names, historicism, contextualism, critical theory, has come a withdrawal of concern with the meaning of judgment and value in the arts and in the everyday activities of criticism and interpretation. Inquiry into first principles or the premises of intellectual work is always hard and often otiose and it can rationalize, of course, a form of group narcissism. But such self-examination does properly belong to any professional calling. And when as seems to have happened with judgment and value, a significant element of the vocation as it's generally been understood stops being mentioned or named, there is usually an interesting motive connected with an evasion of some sort. In the case of value, this remission may have a lot to do with the weakening of the distinction in the commercial democracies between art and commerce, a blurring that can't be laid to the account of any one generation, 
but that has sped up enormously from the advent of social media and the significance now accorded to instant reactions and testimony concerning feelings by those who react. There has been a slower but related change in the morale of scholars who often today visibly suffer from a horror of being untimely. This is a tendency that goes back to the 60s, but again, it has accelerated impressively over the past few years. In the case of judgment, an idea synonymous with taste in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the evasion may be traced in part to a thoughtless acceptance of contextual interpretation as the norm, where the context in question is not aesthetic, but is rather political, historical, sociological. What we have been seeing in short is the long reach of an academic development in which the humanities imitate the social sciences as credulously as the social sciences half a century earlier began imitating the natural sciences. Meanwhile, a major element of our work looks as if it has been partly forgotten or bypassed. The arts, at their best embody a distinctive and integral kind of knowledge. And we should include here criticism and interpretation, those lesser arts that can be taught. Think of them as means of imaginative self-knowledge by which human nature is able to reflect on itself. We reflect on ourselves in a way that invites and requires personal experience as a constant and active assistant. Part of the humanities in this sense too, are the descriptive images of human nature that we encounter in the great originals of metaphysics and moral philosophy, Plato, Montaigne, Kant, others, in whose work imagination and thinking seem to be almost names for the same thing. Here are possible sources of wisdom, by no means excluding practical wisdom, that don't advertise their payoff in terms translatable into cost and benefit as is the case with the sciences. Nor do they arrive at their conclusions by following the methods of the sciences. If we can associate judgment and value in the humanities with a broadly recognizable gain from the study of poems, both epic and lyric, novels, plays, religious tracts or sermons that made a lasting mark, those philosophical and political writings that are meant to be understood as writing. It seems that the good to be derived from such study has something to do with patience. And it imparts a skeptical distrust of the idea that what is popular generally coincides with what is worthwhile. A mass culture proposition that is embraced as readily now as ever, so long as no offensive ethical notes are struck. You see this in the high estimation awarded to message poetry, message fiction, message cinema, and in the displacement of the word convincing by the word relatable. To speak now for myself, one gets a larger idea of the good the humanities may eminently stand for as distinct from the useful social functions they may contingently serve from the sort of deepened understanding that comes from re-reading. A contextually trained student may believe he's saying something important when he observes that, say, Hamlet treats women badly, that he addresses his mother Gertrude and his correspondent Ophelia with an at times inexplicable contempt and even physical revulsion. And when the student finds the word for that kind of bad treatment, the discussion is meant to come to an important pause. But look again at the peculiar and dramatically improbable scene where Hamlet shows at his strangest and most self-indulgent. The scene in his mother's bedchamber where he tells her to abjure all conjugal relations with her husband. And it may take more than one reading or one viewing to come to a full stop at the line, assume a virtue if you have it not. <laughs> On rereading, that moment seems to share a common mood with Hamlet's conduct in a very different scene where he orders a virtuous regimen with the same authority that Brooks no descent. It happens in his instructions to the players uh, where Hamlet, speaking of night lodgings for these actors who are gonna put on a play within a play, 
says to Polonius, will you see the players well bestowed? And Polonius replies, my Lord, I will use them after their dessert. To which Hamlet says, God's bodkins man much better. Use every man after his dessert and who should escape whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. So there's a standard of conduct clear in Hamlet's mind as heedless of the conventions of social status as it is free of the tug of ordinary appetites. Yet Hamlet himself is no more able to conform to his standard than he can admire others who fail to recognize it. The play shows him in search of a motive to will a deed that can be counted as his own and also to be virtuous in this high sense. Yet none of the functions proposed to him of lover, soldier, statesman, revenger will satisfy that demand. His treatment of his mother, and for that matter, of Ophelia, is an extreme instance of the larger perplexity that troubles him. There's not one name for it, but we can describe this predicament and we can do it better on rereading than on a first reading, much better than if we were asked at once to register like or don't like. We may value this play without any superstitious reverence for the previous persons who have admired it, because we judge it to reveal a predicament, to say that word again, that seems unique, that may at first appear anomalous on the human scene, but that on a closer look and a longer look proves to be exemplary. Exemplary, I should add, as I'm using the word, is not the same as typical or common or somehow assignable to a familiar named subset of humanity. Hamlet is an extreme, of course, but we do, I think, go to the theater or movies or read a novel or an essay, partly for what it adds to our knowledge of character, even at an extreme. This is an intellectual and imaginative experience that seems to have been missed by many students I've encountered recently. When we're discussing, for example, the play by Shakespeare and character gets into the conversation, I've sometimes had the impression it was the first time they thought about characters as persons. Of course, they do it in everyday life all the time, but the first time in reading a book for school. They were taught to think of them as representatives of something, a tendency, a prejudice, a dominant or subordinated social type, a bearer of a doctrine notable when the author wrote. This does seem an obvious feature and a regrettable one of the humanities in our time, that everything is treated as a symptom of something. And it makes for an oddly airless solemnity about the creations of art and thought. All the details of a work or a life, even the blessed irrelevant detail is made to feed the story the commentator wants to tell. By this method, we turn imaginative reality into allegory. Going somewhere underneath the tendency is the ideological or quasi-religious determination of scholars to convince themselves that by teaching us what is right and wrong, they can make us better people. But it has never been clear that this is something the study of art and ideas can do from its exertions, or for that matter, something it should aspire to do. Where the natural sciences account for and explore the physical universe, its present state and possibilities, and the social sciences deal with human life in societies, tribes, states, orders, conditions, and other artificial or voluntary groupings. The humanities have for their unique subject matter, the experience, the thoughts and deeds of persons. We're concerned with the survival and the memory of human things in this kind and our studies matter for the close attention we know how to give to such things. But not every relatable circumstance of a human making or doing can meet the criterion of pertinence that must enter into this study. So in choosing what to value and how to value it, we are necessarily involved in a process of judgment that's not less real for the humility or pride or sheer economy that may keep the process only implicit. One purpose of this conference that my colleagues and I had in view when we thought about how to frame it 
was to bring to the surface just these latent considerations that underlie humanistic study and to do so not from the point of view of research, but also uh, for the way our knowledge enters into teaching and learning in a university. Today and tomorrow, you'll hear from an ideal series of speakers, I think, for the large subject before us. Speakers we chose because we believe they not only would illuminate the sense of value as it's known in the humanities, but also would exemplify what we mean by judgment. So welcome again. Uh, we'll go now straight to our first panel, Aesthetic Education and Democratic Life, which Ben Barash uh, will introduce. Good morning and welcome. I'm Ben Barish, um, postdoctoral associate in humanities. Uh, I'd like to echo David's thanks to the Carnegie Foundation and the Yale Humanities Program for supporting this conference, uh, to our wonderful participants, and to all of you for joining us today. I'm delighted to introduce the panelists for our first session on aesthetic education and democratic life. Um, Casey Nelson Blake is the Mendelssohn Family Professor and Director of the Center for American Studies at Columbia. He's a scholar of modern US intellectual and cultural history with an emphasis on artistic modernism. His publications include Beloved Community, the Cultural Criticism of Randolph Bourne, Van Wyck Brooks, Waldo Frank, and Lewis Mumford, The Arts of Democracy, The Armory Show at 100, and most recently at the Center, American Thought and Culture in the mid 20th century. His talk today is entitled Alan Capro, Experience as Art. Robert Gooding Williams, also at Columbia, is the M. Morin Weston Black Alumni Council Professor of African American Studies and Professor of Philosophy and founding director of the Center for Race, Philosophy, and Social Justice. His interests include social and political philosophy and African American political thought, particularly Nietzsche and Du Bois. He's the author of Zarathustra's Dionysian Modernism, Look a Negro, Philosophical Essays on Race, Culture, and Politics, and most recently in the shadow of Du Bois, Afro-American, um, sorry, Afro-Modern Political Thought in America. His talk is entitled Du Bois, Democracy, and Aesthetic Education. Kenneth Winkler, respondent, is Kingman Brewster, Jr., Professor of Philosophy at Yale. He's a scholar of early modern philosophy, metaphysics, and American philosophy. His books include The Cambridge Companion to Barclay and Barclay and Interpretation. Soon to be published are his 2012 Isaiah Berlin lectures at Oxford on the history of philosophical idealism in America from Jonathan Edwards to Martin Luther King. We'll have the two talks followed by Professor Winkler's response and then time for some questions. As David said, please mute yourself during the talks and response. And if you'd like to ask a question, during the Q&A, use the raise hand function at the bottom right of your screen under reactions. Uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists. We'll start with Professor Blake's talk. Thanks so much, Ben, and thanks to everyone at the Yale Humanities Program for organizing this conference. I'm going to use a PowerPoint, so just bear with me for a moment while I bring that up. Okay. I... Right. Okay, I trust this is visible to all of you. Um, and uh, thank you for your patience as I shared the screen. In a 1966 manifesto, Alan Capro identified what he called the current blurring of boundaries dividing the arts and dividing art from life as the defining feature of the experimental art movements of which he was a leading figure. In his view, being an artist no longer meant mastery of a specific skill or genre, so much as what Capro called a philosophical stance before elusive alternatives of not quite art 
and not quite life, and taking up questions of meaning that philosophy departments had left behind. Professional philosophy in the 20th century, he wrote, having generally removed itself from problems of human conduct and purpose, plays instead art's later role as professionalistic activity. It could aptly be called philosophy for philosophy's sake. Now, as art becomes less art, he suggested, it takes on philosophy's early role as critique of life. Remembered as the father of 60s happenings, Alan Capro had an extensive career as artist, critic, and educator, shaped in large part by his early reading of John Dewey's artist experience while a student at NYU and his work with Maya Shapiro in Columbia's art history program. Dewey's critique of what he called the museum conception of art and Shapiro's analysis of art in its social historical totality found reinforcement in Hans Hoffman's reflexive formalism and the relational aesthetics of Black Mountain College artists, particularly John Cage. Beginning in the late 1950s, Capro experimented with artistic practices that distributed the making and interpretation of art among multiple participants and blurred the boundary between art and real life. Over the course of his career, Capro sought to preserve the aesthetic realm from the pressures of both the market and political ideology, while at the same time imbuing everyday life with aesthetic value. If value is the result of artists' crucial decision to act on their own tangible experience, he wrote, the problem is to transmit, transmit that experience effectively in the contemporary department store milieu. He pursued that problem relentlessly, eventually disavowing happenings for smaller scale meditative works that located value in the most intimate aspects of living. By the 1980s, he had reversed Dewey's equation. Experience as art had become his goal. What I'd like to do this morning is briefly trace the arc of Capro's career and suggest we consider his experimental art as an inquiry into the problems of human conduct and purpose that have long been central to education in the humanities. Born in 1927 to a middle-class family in New Jersey, Capro enrolled at NYU in 1946, where he majored in philosophy and art history, while at the same time studying drawing at the Hans Hoffman School of Fine Arts. It was sometime during this period that Capra first encountered Dewey's Art as Experience, published in 1934. Dewey's work and reputation had already by the late 40s faded from the consciousness of most professional philosophers in the US. Philosophy departments had become centers for logical positivism and analytical philosophy, and their faculty thought of Dewey, if they thought of him at all, as a well-meaning but woolly-minded thinker whose philosophy of truth was soft at best and dangerous at worst. Political theorists ignored his democratic theory. His writings on aesthetics slipped either for, even further into obscurity, but not for Capro, whose intense engagement with art as experience proved formative for his career as an artist and intellectual. Dewey's effort to establish what he called the continuity of aesthetic experience with normal processes of living became Capro's own quest, inspiring the happenings he later organized as participatory exercises in art making. Dewey rejected the museum conception of art as part of a larger critique of aesthetic theories that isolated the art object from the social field. Aesthetic experience in his view was embedded in the practical life of the community with audiences as involved as artists in establishing the meaning of art. The product of artistic activity is significantly called the work of art, he wrote. Audiences were thus active interpreters. They were doing art work, a shared process of meaning making. Aesthetic experience prefigured a society of free communication in which citizens could make art, live life as art, indeed remake themselves as works of art. The goal of art making was not about making objects, it was about making new human beings. The self is created in the creation of objects, he wrote. 
Dewey had already entered the aesthetic vocabulary of mid-century modernists by the time Capra picked up his book, most notably at Black Mountain College in North Carolina. From its founding in 1933 to its closing in 1957, Black Mountain was the site where pragmatism and European modernism met, drawing faculty from the US steeped in progressive educational theory and European refugee artists committed to the left modernist pe pedagogy of the Bauhaus. Process, method, and experiment became the watchwords of Black Mountain, with the college's president, John Andrew Rice, insisting on art experience as central to civic education. A relational aesthetic took hold early on, with faculty promoting students' awareness of relationships between artists, art objects, audiences, and the world beyond. According to a 1952 statement of principles, most likely written by the poet Charles Olson, Black Mountain College carefully recognizes that at this point in man's necessities, it is not things in themselves, but what happens between things where the life of them is to be sought. Capra never set foot in Black Mountain, though he was aware of the intersection of pragmatist aesthetics and European modernism that had impelled creative work there. But far more than the college's founders, Capro embraced the romantic strains of Dewey's aesthetics, which loomed larger in his approach than the civic aspirations of Black Mountain's original curriculum. It was the passages where Dewey let loose his inner Whitman or Blake that appeared to have made the greatest impression on him. Art throws off the covers that hide the expressiveness of experienced things, Dewey wrote. It quickens us from the slackness of routine and enables us to forget ourselves by finding ourselves in the delight of experiencing the world about us in its varied qualities and forms. There is a religious feeling that accompanies intense aesthetic experience, Dewey wrote. We are, as it were, introduced into a world beyond this world, which is nevertheless the deeper reality of the world in which we live our ordinary experience. Aesthetic experience in this view was life lived with passion, attention, and wonder, an understanding of the transformative potential of art making that found full expression in Capra's work. Such aspirations found reinforcement in what might seem an unlikely place, the studio at the Hans Hoffman School, where Capro encountered a pedagogy that shaped his own creative work and career as an art professor. Although Hoffman is often regarded as a formalist in the Greenbergian mode, perhaps because Clement Greenberg himself attended his lectures, he never restricted himself to the picture plane in his teaching. As Emily Capper argues in a forthcoming study of Capro's pedagogy, Hoffman was an environment builder who made the plastic space of his classroom a site of argument and experiment. The famous push and pull of his aesthetic enacted in the physical performative exercises he assigned his students and in the lively discussion in his studio. The result was an anti-formalist formalism what Capra describes as an emphasis placed on multi-sensory relations among elements rather than the elements themselves. As at Black Mountain, students learned that an aesthetic of relations had ethical implications. The life work of an artist is the work of art, Hoffman said in 1949, a year after Capra left the school. It includes the whole behavior of the man, his ethical convictions, and his awareness of his creative responsibilities. In 1950, Capro entered the graduate program in art history at Columbia, where he wrote a master's thesis on Mondrian under the direction of Maya Shapiro, then the foremost scholar in the social history of modern art. Shapiro was himself fully conversant with Dewey's work, having been invited by Dewey to comment on several chapters of the manuscript that became art as experienced. If John Dewey is Alan Capro's intellectual father, as Capro's biographer Jeff Kelly has suggested, then Shapiro was his intellectual godfather. Shapiro introduced Capro to a critical method that demanded rigorous attention to art's formal properties while setting artistic production and reception firmly in its social historical setting. 
in the classroom, Shapiro situated works in a pluralistic matrix of, of multiple perceptions. As he explained in a 1966 lecture, critical seeing takes into account others seeing. It is a collective and cooperative seeing and welcomes comparison of different perceptions and judgments. It also knows moments of sudden revelation and intense experiences of unity and completeness, which are shared in others' scrutiny. By the early 1950s, Capra was at a crossroads, pulled simultaneously towards scholarship, criticism, and painting. Despite Capro's talents as an interpreter of modern art, Shapiro saw his student's promise as an artist and encouraged him to pursue a career as a painter. To a large extent, Capro went on to do both. He became a major artist whose work helped redefine what art making could be and also produced essays of art criticism and theory of considerable power and originality. At the same time that he began making abstract paintings and collages, Capra launched himself as a critic with the 1958 eulogy for Jackson Pollock that immediately caught the attention of New York's art community. Capra's essay, The Legacy of Jackson Pollock, dramatically recast Pollock's work in Deweyan terms. Pollock's greatest achievement as a painter in Capra's view was to free artists from painting itself. Pollock created some meaningful paintings, Capro wrote, but he also destroyed painting. The huge all over drip canvases Pollock produced between 1948 and 1950 were more about physical movement, diaristic gesture and ritual than paint on a canvas. There was no single point of entry into Pollock's paintings and no way of ignoring his physical presence once absorbed by them. The viewer followed the energy of paint flung across and beyond the canvas. What we have then, Capra wrote, is art that tends to lose itself out of bounds, tends to fill our world with itself. From this perspective, the paint that covered Pollock's clothes and splattered over the floor of his studio was every bit as important as the paint that landed on the canvas, and perhaps more so. Pollock, as I see him, Capra wrote, left us at the point where we must become preoccupied with and even dazzled by the space and objects of our everyday life, either our bodies, clothes, rooms, or if need be, the vastness of 42nd Street. It was there artists would find the materials for a new concrete art. All of life will be open to them, Capra predicted. They will discover out of ordinary things the meaning of ordinariness. In producing an art out of bounds, Pollock had unleashed a transfiguring aesthetic imagination on the world. Pollock had met Dewey in Capro's opening act as a critic with artistic practice given license to become a new worldly praxis. For many young artists, Capro's essay suggested a way forward from abstract expressionism. As Robert Haywood has put it, Capro upheld the example of Pollock only to break from him. Capro's eulogy also registered what he had learned from John Cage and Robert Rauschenberg, artists whose work likewise sought meaning in the everyday. Capro had attended the New York debut of Cage's 1952 silent piece, 433, at Carl Fisher Hall. As Capro sat in, the, in, in attendance, the sounds of silence were interspersed with audience members giggling and coughing nervously, the humming of the ventilation system and police sirens and other traffic noise from the streets outside. Cage was opening the audience to the full landscape of sound, encouraging intense aesthetic attention to the music of daily life. In an exhibition of the all white paintings by Rauschenberg that had anticipated Cage's 433, Capra found what he called a numbing, devastating silence that was at the same time an announcement of possibility. He saw his own shadows move as he walked in front of the white canvases and recognized in that very act of perception a new kind of art making. Looking back, Capra said of Rauschenberg and Cage, there is no marking of the boundary of the artwork or the boundary of so-called everyday life. They merge. 
Campra became one of Cage's closest students enrolling in the famous course on composition that Cage taught at the New School in 1957 and 58 to learn more about chance operations and the manipulation of taped sounds, both of which figured in his later happenings. Cage also provided a pathway to Zen Buddhism, most likely the version Cage had learned sitting in on D.T. Suzuki's lectures at Columbia. Suzuki was himself steeped in American philosophical traditions. His first published essay was on Emerson. He was an avid reader of James, and he may well have met Dewey when he first came to the US as a young man in the 1890s. There were parallels between Suzuki's version of Zen and the Emerson Dewey lineage that did not escape Capra. A hostility to dualisms, a body and mind, a subject and object, a belief in experience as flux, an openness to uncertainty, and a desire to overcome the limits of self. At the very moment that James and Dewey disappeared from philosophy syllabi, they appeared before American artists in Zen garb. Campra will always be remembered as the creator of 18 happenings in six parts, an event that took place six times in October of 1959 in the loft-like space of New York's Rubin Gallery. Although Cage had staged his own happening seven years earlier at Black Mountain, it was 18 happenings that introduced the term and elevated Capro as a major figure in the New York avant-garde scene. Contrary to the popular conception of such events as loose and improvisational, 18 happenings was tightly scored with instructions for participants and members of the audience. A form letter invitation for the event warned attendees not, quote, to look for painting, sculpture, the dance, or music. The artist disclaims any intention to provide them. Nor should they plan to sit passively as at the theater. As one of the 75 persons present, you will become a part of the happening. You will simultaneously experience them. What those who attended experienced was a disorienting one hour multimedia event designed to assault all five senses. Audience members entered a law space divided into three rooms with chairs arranged differently in each and were instructed to move from room to room at timed intervals. Semi-transparent plastic sheets allowed limited visual access to activities in adjoining spaces but offered no sonic insulation to prevent sounds from leaking from one room to another. Capro's collages hung in two of the rooms. The overall effect was of urban industrial clutter, plastic, torn canvas, paper, a hanging electrical cord. Different activities were timed to take place simultaneously in each of the rooms. Slides were projected on walls, lights went on and off, a Muslim tarp was painted. Robert Whitman lit matches behind a plastic panel. Rosalind Montague made orange juice and passed out samples. Tapes of electronic mu music and raw noise competed with the reading of poems and fragmentary declamations on art by Lucas Samaras and other participants. The artists Capro enlisted moved robotically as they carried out their assigned tasks. And Capro himself wield a mirrored sandwich man construction from room to room, a record player inside played dance music as he moved along. In 18 happenings, Capra later recalled, I set up a three ring circus space, but unlike a circus, audience members were not allowed to sit passively and applaud, but were instead deployed as props moved around in a sequence and given strict instructions not to applaud. Far more than any of his later works, 18 Happenings choreographed the audience using them as raw materials in a flowing three-dimensional collage of space, time, sound, image, and smell. Capro later remembered moving people around in and out of environmentally filled areas like a literalization of the cloddedness of an abstract expressionist painting. Capro may have kept a tight grip on the performance as the happening circus master, 
but he ceded interpretive authority over the work's meaning to his, in, to his invited guests. Audience members were forced to work, to do artwork, to understand activities that they could never see entirely from a single perspective. A review Capro published in the Village Voice under a pseudonym emphasized the deliberate opacity of the piece. There is a shattering awareness of unawareness, he wrote. Things are looking at us, but we cannot see them. Meaning could not be seen, but instead had to be hammered out in conversation during the breaks Capro built into the schedule of 18 happenings. Indeed, the intervals between the six parts ran longer than the performances, leaving time for those in attendance to compare notes on the confusing spectacle that they had witnessed. What William James wrote of discursified thinking aptly describes the interpretive process Capro had in mind. We exchange ideas, James wrote, we lend and borrow verifications, get them from one another by means of social intercourse. All truth thus gets verbally built out, stored up and made available for everyone. 18 Happenings represented Capro's first critique of traditional exhibition spaces. While Cage performed experimental work in concert halls and galleries, Capro filled sites with the detritus of urban consumer culture. In a 1961 installation titled Yard, Capro piled hundreds of used tires in the backyard of the Martha Jackson Gallery in Manhattan, which usually served as a sculpture garden. Viewers who came to view art hanging on pristine white walls were invited to go out back and wade through filthy, smelly tires and toss them around. Pollock's overall paintings reemerged as a junk landscape, a catalog juxtaposed a photograph in one of his paintings, flinging paint across the canvas with one of Capro in the yard. I think Capra was striving for a non-mimetic urban realism, an art of flux and excess made from the materials of city life that would force viewers to see their environment anew. His 1962 piece, Words, bombarded visitors with the random visual iconography of advertisements, newspapers, movie marquees, and graffiti, all accompanied by recorded music, lectures, and nonsense talk played simultaneously on three record players. Here was the culture of 42nd Street Capra had invoked in his essay on Pollock and the sounds of the city that reverberated through Carl Fisher Hall during the performance of Cages 433. As the 60s progressed, Capra wearied of the hoopla surrounding the happenings he and other artists were making and worried he'd become a party to a culture of spectacle that prevented critical reflection on his work's meaning. His writings called for the elimination of the audience and his events, the term he now preferred to happenings, came to focus on the physical activities, conversations, and consciousness of participants. Capro gave participants looser, more open-ended instructions and allowed them greater freedom to formulate strategies for their execution. He also dispersed activities geographically, sometimes in multiple cities at once, so that full understanding of the work emerged long after the fact, as he and others gathered to swap stories about their experiences. If the identification of happenings with groovy 60s uh, Saturnalia repelled him, so did the mounting pressure to make his artwork a delivery system for political ideology. While his participatory aesthetic shared much with the early New Left's vision of participatory democracy, in the end, Capra was not a political artist. His modernism in the streets differed significantly from the theatrical politics of the Yippies or the anarchist performances of Judith Molina and Julian Beck's living theater. He resisted pressures to align his practice with the movements of the day and considered his one attempt to create a work for a Vietnam protest, a fiasco. He reflected afterward that the more the end was literally a kind of reward, that is the achievement of a political goal, the less the work would have the broader philosophical implications 
that I'm interested in. So you might say that my work is not strictly topical, although its materials are topical. Capra's pre preoccupation was not political art in my view, but social art, something that the critic and editor Thomas Hess noted as early as 1960 in an essay on New York's rising generation of experimental artists. Unlike Dada with its revolt against bourgeois culture, Hess observed that the new protest is in favor of society or of people in general. The only rule kept is that there must be at least two people in each game, artist and onlooker. One gets the feeling that many of these works could die of loneliness. The word loneliness hinted at the social psychological concerns that came to the fore in Capra's work in the late 60s, as he saw a social art that dispersed art making and socialized the self. If these new events had a subject, it was subjectivity. The transcendence of self through participatory aesthetic experience emerged as the focus of his practice, setting in motion a profound transformation of his work and life. Art could be made without an artist. The unartist situated in the everyday was his ideal. Campo explored these themes in a major event titled Fluids, which the Pasadena Art, Musician, uh, Art Museum commissioned in October 1967 in connection with a mid-career retrospective of his work. Over the course of three days, teams of artists and students joined Capro in constructing multiple ice structures at 15 different sites in Pasadena and Los Angeles. Most of the participants were new to building and had to come up with construction strategies on the spot. And of course, they were in a race against time, piling up ice as it melted in the hot California sun and trying to keep their structures intact, at least for the period of their initial construction. These works then began to melt to become the fluids of the piece's title. Fluids brought together many of Capro's concerns in this period. The piece was process art that produced no permanent art objects, thus offering a sly commentary on the respect a retrospective at the Pasadena Museum, and also a commentary, it seems to me, on minimalist art. Fluids likewise offered a critical perspective on work itself, juxtaposing playful, non-purposeful activity with routinized labor and winked knowingly at the idea of planned obsolescence. Capro sought to foster a communal process of knowing among participants in planning, building, and then reflecting on the work. All was fluid, the event itself, the boundaries between solids, liquids, sun, and air, the boundaries between intellectual and physical labor, the boundaries of art and life, and ultimately the boundaries between self and others. Campra's move to California in 1969 to take a position at the new California Institute of the Arts, CalArts, prompted further explorations into the social formation of subjectivity. Feminist faculty and students at the school like Judy Chicago, Miriam Shapiro, and Suzanne Lacey insisted that male faculty address the gender politics of artistic practice. Capro responded with works that explored rituals of the body and human intimacy, often with attention to strained relationships between women and men. The scale of his work shrank in size, sometimes involving no more than two participants, and their focus shrank as well to physical attraction and repulsion, eye contact, the need for human connection and the inhibitions that prevented connection. 1975's Comfort Zones is a case in point. The work involved a woman and man who approach one another first by telephone and then over time in person, working through the tensions of invading one another's personal space and then making eye contact. It was a stark, tense, minimalist piece that explored attraction, fear, discomfort, and longing. 
It was also clearly a work about the rituals of communication, courtship, and intimacy between women and men, which were opened up to public scrutiny and discussion by the feminist movement. The next logical step was to shift the site of his work to the confines of his own intimate life, to conversations and activities he staged with friends and with his wife, and then finally to his own individual experience. In the 1970s, Capra followed Cage's example and began a serious Zen practice that continued for the rest of his life. He scripted events he performed alone which intensified awareness of his own body and mundane activities, recording his pulse, breathing on the mirror, brushing his teeth, interrupting the routinized and unnoticed activities that consumed his life. I looked up once and saw, really saw my face in the mirror. Caprell had moved from Dewey and Pollock to 42nd Street to a Zen emptying of the self and to bodily enactments of personal experience. The pragmatist, romantic, and Buddhist traditions he admired sought the transcendence of the autonomous self and art object alike, alike in pursuit of a spiritualized existence. In his later essays, Capra wrote as heir to those traditions, art as experience had become experience as art. Let's say he proposed that art is a weaving of meaning-making activity with any or all parts of our lives. In the 60s, he had described experimental art as a prelude, a prelude to what his readers might have asked. Now in 1987, 40 years after he first entered Hoffman's studio, Capro offered an answer. Experimental art can be an introduction to right living and after that introduction, art can be bypassed for the main course. Thanks very much. Okay, should I just uh, jump in? Yes, thanks, thanks, Bob. Okay, great. Uh, so the title of my piece is Du Bois Democracy and Aesthetic and Education. Um, and uh, I, I, I'll, I'll say uh, right up front that it's a shortened version of uh, the introduction to a larger project, the working title of which is uh, Du Bois's Political Aesthetics, uh, uh, The Ends of Democracy and the Ends of Beauty. So during the decade of the First World War, African-American philosopher W.E.B. Du Bois argued that white supremacy functioned both domestically and internationally to thwart the democratic political aspirations of the earth's darker peoples, thus rendering them vulnerable to race-based economic exploitation and anti-black mob violence. During the same decade, Du Bois elaborated an aesthetics, a philosophy of beauty that conceptualized beauty as a political force capable of supporting the struggle against white supremacy, of sustaining the moral resolve required to fight it and of undermining its grip on the individuals who perpetuated it. Du Bois believed that white supremacy is a deeply rooted feature of American political life, that it persists despite its anti-democratic tendencies. White supremacy is a powerful cultural force that resists rational, re rational revision, he argued, because it is rooted in the entrenched habits, the moral character of the white supremacist. Beauty has a role to play in opposing white supremacy and fostering a more inclusive democracy, first, because it can strengthen our determination uh, to fight it, the obduracy of the white supremacist notwithstanding, and second, because it can unsettle and help to transform the pernicious habits that perpetuate it. Du Bois' philosophy of beauty presupposes a narrative of the history of modern struggles for democracy, a moral psychology of white supremacy, and a normative conception of democracy. According to the historical narrative, the modern democratic political movement has embodied a perpetual and perpetually embattled struggle to promote the normative democratic ideal of an unrestricted franchise against the rule of self-interested capitalists in the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution. 
Du Bois's moral psychology of white supremacy helps explain the limited helps explain the limited success of that struggle and the correlated restriction of what he calls the democratic development, excuse me, the correlated restriction of democratic development uh, to the white races, including the failure of reconstruction and the advent of a new industrial imperialism. Uh, in Du Bois's historical narrative, uh, uh, the, 18, the year 1877 looms large. It marks a critical juncture defined by the end of Reconstruction and Henry Stanley's arrival at the mouth of the Congo River. According to the story Du Bois tells, the demise of Reconstruction and the beginning of the scramble for Africa that Stanley's travels occasioned gave rise to a mode of global governance essentially characterized by two interrelated dynamics. One, the ongoing democratic development of the white working class, its success that is, in reforming the prevailing imperialist political order by promoting policies that reduced the capitalist domination and exploitation of white workers in Europe and America. And two, the persistent restriction of the democratic development of the world's darker races, thus the darker races ongoing subjection to domination and exploitation by white workers united with white capitalists. Du Bois's name for this mode of governance is democratic despotism. And his moral psychology of white supremacy is part of his attempt to explain the conjunction of these dynamics. That is to say, why the norms advanced by the modern democratic movement, while effective at constraining capitalist interests when they targeted white workers, were not effective in fettering those interests when they targeted the world's darker peoples. On Du Bois' account, the white supremacist moral character that informs and sustains white Christian culture blocks the democratic, excuse me, blocks the democratic development of the world's darker peoples by permitting and encouraging the normatively unfettered subjection of non-white races to capitalist economic interests. Elsewhere, I examine Du Bois' arguments for this last claim and for his related account of the interplay between racial hatred and economic exploitation in the United States. For present purposes, however, I want to emphasize that Du Bois's political aesthetics, again, his idea that beauty is a political force capable, capable of advancing the struggle against white supremacy, belongs to a larger argument about the role beauty can play in advancing the democratic development of the world's darker peoples. Given Du Bois' picture of the mode of rule of rule structuring the modern world circa 1915, it follows that a politics that helped to unsettle white Christian culture would assist that development, other things being equal. By the time he wrote Dark Water, Du Bois had come to the conclusion that the habits of mind constituting the moral character of the white supremacist resist rational revision through scientific inquiry and internal critique. This conclusion, what I call Du Bois's entrenchment thesis, was a source of concern to him for it implied that science and logical reasoning would not suffice to unsettle white Christian culture. During the era of the Great War, Du Bois responds to this concern by arguing that racial oppression and the restriction of darker people's democratic development to the extent that they were permitted and perpetuated by entrenched cognitive effective and excuse me, by the entrenched cognitive effective and motivational dispositions characteristic of the white supremacists must be attacked with weapons, he says, of sudden and immediate assault. Du Bois, I argue, thought that beauty could serve as one of those weapons. Distinguishing between natural and artistic beauty, he maintained that the former could help black citizens contend with their despair and pessimism at the possibility of undermining racial oppression when it was propped up by the stubborn resistance of white Christian culture to rational appeal. Regarding the latter, uh, uh, he believed that it could transform the white Christian, challenging and discomposing uh, her religious self-understanding, the, the latter uh, again being artistic beauty. All that said, let me immediately emphasize that Du Bois' political defense of beauty is not simply a defense of its efficacy as a weapon. In addition, it is a defense of beauty's pedagogical power, of its contribution to the cultivation of democratic citizenship. Du Bois' account of the political power of aesthetic education, whether directed towards the pessimism of the oppressed or the recalcitrant to reason commitments of the oppressor, depends on his normative notion of democracy no less than on his conception of beauty. In the later part of this, of my remarks today, I will briefly sketch that conception 
which deserves a more detailed analysis than I'll be able to offer this morning. But I want to sketch it anyway in order to introduce Du Bois's contention that one of, du of beauty's defining features, its power to astonish through its unfamiliarity, has a critical role to play in the cultivation of characteristically democratic virtue, to wit, citizens' openness, their receptivity to possibilities of feeling, thought, and action that strike them as strange or remote. First, however, I reconstruct Du Bois's defense of democracy as a normative ideal. I then re return to the idea of beauty's pedagogical power via, via an analysis of Du Bois' understanding of, of the culture of democracy, on his account, the culture of the crowd, which aesthetic education geared to the virtue of receptivity is meant to promote. So now I'm gonna say a bit in the next section of the paper uh, about uh, Du Bois's democratic ideal, his normative conception of democracy. Du Bois defends democracy as a normative ideal by, argues, by arguing that democracy is needed to realize the broadest justice to a state's citizens. Specifically, he argues that justice requires inclusiveness and that inclusiveness requires democracy. But what is inclusiveness and why does justice require it? Du Bois answers the first question, uh, what is inclusiveness, uh, 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 in political terms, conceptualizing inclusiveness as the inevitably disruptive incorporation of previously excluded perspectives and voices into the mix of considerations that determine how a, po a polity, uh, uh, excuse me, how a body politic is to be governed. In his words, I'm quoting here, the addition of new wisdom new points of view and new interests that must be from time to time bewildering and confusing. Thus, while those who have a voice in the body politic have expressed their wishes and sufferings, the appearance of new interests and complaints means disarrangement and confusion to an older equilibrium. Du Bois answers the second question, <clears throat> why does justice require inclusiveness, Du Bois answers the second question in epistemic terms, arguing that justice requires the accumulation of wisdom from diverse sources and that gathering wisdom from such sources requires inclusiveness. The people of a democratic nation, he writes, and I'm quoting again, holds in the heads and hands of its individual citizens the vast mind of knowledge out of which it may build a just government, a government built on the broadest justice to every citizen. Justice for Du Bois concerns the treatment of individuals. It is essentially a matter of responsiveness of according due, to cons due of according due consideration to everyone's concerns. Thus the law's characteristic of a, of a just government give due consideration uh, to the interests and wishes of all citizens, including their interests in having their rights protected. But to be just in this sense, laws must reflect the epistemic diversity of the citizenry. In the words of one contemporary philosopher, they must express citizen situated knowledge. The fact that citizens from different walks of life have different perspectives of problems and policies of public interest, experiences that have evidential import for devising and evaluating solutions. Justice demands epistemic diversity for in the last analysis, Du Bois writes, only the sufferer knows his sufferings. Just laws require inclusiveness for just laws take account of epistemic diversity. And because taking account of epistemic diversity calls for incorporating previously excluded perspectives and insights into the determination of how a body politic is to be governed. The reasoning supporting the last step of Du Bois's argument that inclusiveness requires democracy, the, universal, the universalization of the franchise, is perhaps all too obvious, namely that inclusiveness requires the univers that inclusiveness requires the universalization of the franchise. For without extending suffrage to groups previously excluded, their members' distinctive perspectives and insights will not figure into the determination of the laws. Um, so <clears throat> the next section uh, moves on to a discussion of uh, Du Bois's account of the culture of democracy. The title of this, of this section is entitled uh, The Discovery of the Crowd. In the concluding chapter of Democracy in America, Volume 1, uh, Tocqueville excuses his book's want of attention to Negroes and Indians, both in quotes, by arguing that these topics are like tangents to my subject being American but not democratic, and my main business has been to describe democracy. 
In contrast to Tocqueville, Du Bois believes that part of understanding democracy in America is making sense of its failures and especially its exclusions. And again, he believes that these exclusions stem from a democratic despotism that is sustained through the inhibition of the democratic development of the world's darker peoples by the white Christian culture prevalent in Europe and America. To combat that culture, Du Bois plumps for the promotion of a democratic culture animated in part by the pedagogical power of beauty. As the following two passages attest, if read with an eye to the ramifications for democracy in America and elsewhere, the contrast between these cultures can suitably be described as a contrast between the culture of the mob and the culture of the crowd. And uh, the first passage uh, comes from a chapter of, Di of Dark Water uh, entitled, uh, uh, I think it's entitled On Work and Wealth, and the second from a passage entitled uh, Of the Ruling of Men. So the first passage. The meaning of America is the beginning of the discovery of the crowd. The crowd is not so well trained as a Versailles garden party of Louis XIV, but it is far better trained than the Sanculat and it has infinite possibilities. What a world this will be when human possibilities are freed, when we discover each other, when the stranger is no longer the potential criminal and the certain inferior. The second passage now. In fact, no one knows himself but that self's own soul. The vast and wonderful knowledge of this marvelous universe is locked in the bosoms, bosoms of its individual souls. To tap this mighty reservoir of experience, knowledge, beauty, love, and, and deed, we must uh, appeal not to the few, not to some souls, but to all. Uh, the narrower the appeal, the poorer the culture. The wider the appeal, the more magnificent are the possibilities. Infinite is human nature. We make it finite by choking back the mass of men by attempting to speak for others, to interpret and act for them. And we end by acting for ourselves and using the world as our private property. The first sentence of the first passage is ambiguous. Read as an historian's observation that a particular event, the discovery, excuse me, the beginning of the discovery of the crowd, uh, 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 Sorry, let me start that sentence again. Read as an, as an historian's observation that a particular event, the beginning, of the, discovery, the, the beginning of the discovery of the crowd, led to the determination of the meaning of America. It seems that Du Bois's interest is to identify the causal origins of Americans' habits, prejudices, and the like. But interpreted more plausibly as a claim that America is defined by a normatively distinctive project, more exactly by a founding, a beginning commitment to make known, to discover to the world a polity organized around the concept of the crowd, it appears that Du Bois' central concern is to expose America's ongoing failure to honor that commitment. The allusions to Louis XIV and the sans are telling, on one hand, reference to an absolute monarch whose rule has been described as a reign of etiquette, on the other, reference to a social movement whose name signifies its repudiation of the costume and ceremonial manners of the Ancien Regime. In the regimented world of uh, the Versailles Garden Party, strict observance of the detailed codes governing the actions of the king's courtiers entailed the regularity of routine, allowing no prospect for the play of the unfamiliar. If, however, there is no adherence to routine and little training to enforce it, as in the case of Du Bois' saint Poulot, the background of familiar practices presupposed by the appearance of unfamiliar alternatives to routine is missing. For Du Bois, the welcome advent of the unfamiliar of possibilities represented by the stranger is characteristic of the crowd, which is neither so chaotic, so unruly that deviation from established rules is not in principle possible, nor so rigid, so rule bound as to frown on every deviation. Neither, neither formlessly anarchic, nor demanding inflexible adherence to well-defined codes of behavior, the culture of the crowd is dynamically responsive to strange voices and to the unfamiliar, unanticipated possibilities they express. If America has failed to honor its founding commitment, it is because its citizens have yet to discover each other and so to free those possibilities. Crowd, stranger, criminal. In conjoining these three terms to explain the meaning of America, Du Bois may mean to echo Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Man of the Crowd, <coughs> a story Poe published in 1840. He may, he may mean to, to echo Poe's short story, but the particulars of his argument I read as improvising on Georg Simmel's essay, 
the stranger. In Poe's story, a convalescent in the, manner, in the manner of a detective shadows a stranger through a London crowd, drawn to him because he cannot find the correct category to classify him, and ultimately judging him to be a criminal, a genius of deep crime, because he refuses to be alone, or arguably on uh, one critic's reading, because he refuses legibility. But Du Bois's paradigmatic stranger, the American Negro, refuses nothing. Rather, the Negro is judged to be a latent criminal and an and, and indubitable inferior, because in Zimmel's terms, white Christian culture is a culture of the mob that regards the stranger not as a member of the group, but as akin to a barbarian. Zimmel's stranger is not the wanderer who, comes to, wanderer who comes today and goes tomorrow, but the man who comes today and stays tomorrow, bringing qualities into a group that are not and cannot be indigenous to it. In contrast to the peoples the Greeks dubbed barbarians, peoples who were not Greek, who were not Greek, not members of the crowd, a group's relation to the stranger is a relation to members who are close by yet remote, for they are not bound by roots to the partisan dispositions of the group. Building on but extending Sim Zimmel's uh, conceptual framework, Du Bois distinguishes two kinds of group, the crowd marked by, by receptivity to the unfamiliar possibilities and dispositions that the group strangers represent, and the mob marked by a tendency to constrain an otherwise infinite human nature by choking back and usurping the voices that would express those possibilities. As he puts the point in his portrait of, uh, of the life of Samuel Coleridge Ta Taylor, the composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor. We know in America how to discourage, quirk, choke, and murder ability when it so far forgets itself so as to choose a dark skin. Du Bois figures white Christian culture as a culture of the mob, more precisely of the choking, stifling lynch mob, for it silences the voices of the strangers who've chosen dark skin, projecting them as subhuman criminals, but uh, like excuse me, for it silences the voices of the strangers who have chosen dark skin, projecting them as subhuman criminals, but like the ancients barbarians, not as members of the group, not as fellow members of the polity. If then Du Bois does intend to improvise on Poe as well as Zimmel, perhaps we should read him as, re read him as reading Poe as allegorizing the tendency to violence that ener ener energizes the lynch mob in his depiction of a detective's maniacal pursuit of a stranger in a crowd. Du Bois' notion of the culture of the crowd and the culture of the mob are ideal types, con conceptual constructs that generally serve him as tools for imagining the possibility of advancing America's founding normative project while keeping attuned to the recurrent upsurge of attitudes that threaten to suffocate that possibility. Here I consider an example of this general uh, of serv serviceability by examining one of Darkwater's short stories, The Second Coming. Within Darkwater, Du Bois places the second coming just after the chapter that introduces the concept of the crowd, in part to help him explicate that concept, but also to demonstrate the importance of tethering a democratic and emancip emancipatory political imagination to an acknowledgment of the power of the forces that oppose it. Reworking the New Testament's account of the Epiphany, the second coming tells the, the tale of the arrival of three bi bishops in Valdosta, Georgia, where a black Christ has been born to Lucy, a young black girl who could pass for white. Each of the bishops, one white, one black, and one yellow, has received a formal letter summoning him to Valdosta. When the black bishop receives his missive, he says, I must go down there. Those colored folk are acting strangely. And when the yellow bishop receives his, he writes, I have been strangely bidden to Valdosta. As the story unfolds, we learn that the white bishop was already headed to Valdosta to attend the wedding of Marguerite, the daughter of the governor, of the daughter of the governor, presumably the governor of Georgia. After the white bishop arrives, the governor states that he uh, never saw blacks act so, actually he uses the N word here, opining that they seem to be expecting something. What's the crowd, Jim? The governor asked the chauffeur. Later we hear that when a wagon, the searching crowd yelled, yelled fire, all laughed and ran. Finally, as the governor hurls the white bishop to his waiting limousine, after the latter has discovered that Lucy and her baby are black, he asks, did you hear anything? Do you hear that noise? The crowd is growing strangely, the crowd is growing strangely on the streets, and there seems to be a fire, a fire over toward the east. I never saw so many people here. I fear violence, a mob, a lynching. I fear heart. 
The coming of a black Christ causes black folk to behave strangely and an Asian bishop to feel the pull of a strange event. A similar feeling enlivens the crowd, apparently, apparently, for, it's, for it is growing strangely. In keeping with this concept of the crowd, and perhaps with an eye to Matthew 25, verse, uh, lines 42 through 46, uh, Du Bois depicts a particular surging crowd uh, as able to welcome and accommodate the strange appearance of a black Christ. But is that what will happen? A question that is prompted by the governor's fearful suggestion that the crowd is potentially a mob, that it could well become a violent lynch mob. To be sure, I do not suggest that uh, uh, Du Bois's governor means to discriminate between the concepts of the crowd and the mob. I do suggest, however, that Du Bois means to discriminate between them, and more importantly, to highlight the fragility of America's normatively distinctive project, its ever-present ever vulnerability to the white Christian culture of the mob. Fully to appreciate Du Bois's point, we need only notice that by setting the, South, the second coming in Valdosta, Georgia, he frames his fiction as a retelling of the story of Mary Turner, the black victim of a white mob that hung her upside down from a tree, set her clothes afire with gasoline, cut from her womb the baby with whom she was eight months pregnant, and then crushed the baby's foot, her, the baby's head underfoot before spraying her body with before spraying her body with bullets, all because Turner dared to protest the lynching of her husband, husband the day before. Du Bois envisions a gathering crowd disposed to welcome the strange arrival of, arrival of a black baby Jesus. But his political imagination is troubled by the brutal murder of another black baby and his black mother just north of Aldosta and just a little less than two years before Dark Water was published. Recognizing that any crowd can easily become a mob, thus that the project of organizing a polity around the idea of the crowd is ever pregnable, he reminds us that our effort to create a culture that welcomes the stranger is a precarious enterprise that can be undone by a, that can be undone by a resurgence of the culture it seeks to displace. If Mary Turner's child could not escape the violence of the mob, there is no assurance that Lucy's child will escape it to survive to survive a modern day Valdosta version of the massacre of the innocents, even as the sound of music, some strong and mighty chord announces its coming. In the treatment of the child, Du Bois writes, the world foreshadows, it foreshadows its own uh, future and strength. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so I'm quoting Du Bois here. In the treatment of the child, the world foreshadows its own future and strength. All, world, all words and all thinking lead to the child, uh, to that vast immortality and the wide sweep of infinite possibility which the child represents. In explaining the immortality and infinite possibility that the child, rep that the child represents, Du Bois invokes Wordsworth's intimations of immortality, remarking that, and quoting, I'm quoting Du Bois again, the heaven that lies about us uh, that lies about our infancy is but the ideals come true which every generation of children is capable of bringing. In this particular context, the Darkwater Chapel entitled The Immortal Child, Du Bois's ideals are educational aims, first among which is the aim to achieve freedom through the development of human souls. That the thought of fulfilling these ideals involves an intimation of heavenly immortality suggests that the ideals are universal and enduring, bound neither by place nor time. More important to Du Bois, however, the, however, is the prospect of an earth, earthly, his words, practical immortality, an ongoing cultivation of freedom and self-development that continues through the endless life of children's children. For Du Bois, the work of educating children is a multi-generational project to free the infinite possibilities of human self-development that the white Christian mob chokes back. Uh, it, is, it is part of a struggle to create a polity shaped by the democratic culture of the crowd. As the second coming shows, the work of educating black children compound, compounds that struggle for the culture of the mob ever threatens to crucify these children's souls and so ever puts black people's future at risk and their faith in question. How can faith in black people's future be sustained? How can it be protected from creeping feelings of despair and pessimism at the prospect of a practical immortality of black souls? Beginning with the litany of Atlanta and its anguish over God's silence and continuing through the princess of the Hither Isles with its suicidal ending and the second coming with its anxious ambiguous ending, Darkwater tacitly but repeatedly poses these questions but only addresses them explicitly in, of, in the chapter entitled Of Beauty and Death. Here Du Bois philosophically affirms that establishing a polity shaped by the culture of the crowd 
requires not only a radical transformation of the souls of the members of the mob, the souls of white folk, but resistance to despair and pessimism at the possibility of establishing uh, such a polity. Uh, the last section of my presentation is entitled uh, Aesthetic Education. Uh, in contextualizing Du Bois's arguments for aesthetic education, uh, uh, perhaps the most pertinent point of comparison is Friedrich Schiller's influential letters on the aesthetic education of man. Schiller writes in the wake of the overthrow of the despotic Ancien Regime and in reaction to the reign of ter terror. In contrast, Du Bois writes in advance of the hope for overthrow of, of a despotic form of democracy, democratic despotism, and in reaction to racial oppression. Heir to, heir to the tradition of modern Republican political thought, Schiller responds to the terror by defending aesthetic education after the revolution as a vehicle for cultivating the moral and civic virtue required to ensure the stability and dur duration of the new French Republic. Uh, heir to the same tradition, Du Bois responds to, the terror, responds to the terror of despotism itself by defending aesthetic education before the revolution, so to speak, as a means the oppressed wishing to overthrow their oppressors might deploy against them. For, for Schiller, art facilitates the integration of our sensible and intellectual natures, thus enabling us to achieve the autonomy that moral and civic virtue demand. In the words of one commentator, it frees us from subservience to our immediate needs and stimulates us to exercise our fledgling powers of thinking and deciding. In the perspective of the letters, the intricate power of aesthetic experience helps secure political stability. On this point, however, Du Bois inverts Schiller, arguing for forms of aesthetic education that by disintegrating uh, the self-understanding of the Christian white supremacists and highlighting the possibility of subverting racial oppression threaten political, uh, threaten political stability. Uh, the key to Du Bois's defense of aesthetic education is his concept of beauty. For the purposes of, the, of my present remarks, I restrict myself to encapsulating the content of the concept, uh, leaving a more detailed analysis for another uh, time <clears throat> and another place. In Du Bois's view, an event, a natural occurrence, a work of art, a religious vision, or a life, an event counts as beautiful just, uh, just, in case, just in case it comes to a fitting end, like the end of a good story, for example, uh, comes to a fitting end that casts the event itself in an unfamiliar, astonishing light, in a strange light. He also implies that the completion of an event, its coming to a suitable end, is necessary for the event's unfamiliarity to come into view. Due to their astonishing unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity Du Bois, art, du Bois argues, artistic and natural beauties can enhance citizens' receptivity to unfamiliar possibilities of thought, feeling, and action, and in this way, promote the culture of the crowd. For Du Bois, receptivity to unfamiliar possibilities is, is a form of alertness to those possibilities that involves a desire to hold oneself accountable to them, to answer to them. Where the democratic culture of the crowd tends to prevail, citizens embody the virtue of receptivity, which is why the culture of the crowd is dynamically responsive to strange voices and the unfamiliar, unfamiliar possibilities they express. Or more exactly, why it is dynamically responsive to unfamiliar possible considerations that stem from strangers' reservoir of experience to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to considerations excuse me, or more exactly, why it is dynamically responsive to un unfamiliar possible considerations that stem from strangers' reservoir, uh, reservoir of experience to considerations that can and ought to be brought to bear in determining how the polity is governed. Receptivity requires that citizens desire to respond to strangers' experience-based atypical insights, which is to require that citizens desire to answer to those insights by consider them, considering them as potentially bearing on their deliberations about how the polity uh, uh, should be governed. Where the anti-democratic white Christian culture of the mob tends to prevail, white citizens lack the receptivity characteristic of the crowd, which is why that culture chokes back strange voices and remains oblivious to possibilities that should have been brought to bear in determining how the polity is governed. Where that, that culture tends to prevail, moreover, 
Moreover, it can erode resistant black citizens' capacity for receptivity, not now to the unfamiliar possibilities to which that culture is itself oblivious, but to the increasingly remote, remote and to that extent unfamiliar possibility of acting to subvert racial oppression. When white Christian habits of mind have become so thoroughly entrenched that they seem to preclude the possibility of subverting racial oppression, resistant black citizens may cease to see that possibility as existing for them. They may relinquish their desire to answer to it and finally hopelessly quit their efforts at subversion. For these reasons then, Du Bois believes that aesthetic education meant to combat white supremacy, excuse me, uh, meant to combat white supremacist mob culture and to promote the culture of the crowd must proceed along at least two tracks, each of which is premised on the assumption that receptivity to possibilities is, to borrow a phrase from a contemporary political theorist, disclosure dependent. To desire to answer to a range of unfamiliar possible considerations that bear on her understanding of what the broadest justice requires, the Christian white supremacist must come to, come to view those considerations as belonging to, in Martha Nussbaum's felicitous phrasing, her circle of concern, that is, as deriving from voices and lives that morally matter to her. Similarly, to desire to answer to the remote possibility of subverting racial oppression, when the penetrating grip of racial oppression on Black lives and the future of Black children's children seems to preclude the possibility of subversion, the despairing and pessimistic opponents of racial oppression must, must come, come anew to view that possibility as a prospect that exists for them, as a possibility that because it has not been removed from their social, social world, they could enact. Regarding the first case, the function of aesthetic education and through the medium of artistic beauty is radically to transform again to disintegrate the, white, the Christian white supremacist self-understanding by disclosing to her, to her astonishment, that her circle of concern properly, com compre properly comprehends black lives and voices. Regarding the second, the function of aesthetic education through the medium of natural beauty is to relieve blacks of their tendency to despair, to despair of and quit the struggle by disclo disclosing to them, to their astonishment, that their social world comprehends and has not yet foreclosed the prospect of action that subverts racial oppression. To conclude, I adduce two theses that summarize Du Bois's picture of the role aesthetic education can play in combating democratic despotism. One is that, one is that the astonishing unfamiliar, unfamiliarity of artistic beauty can enhance the Christian white supremacist receptivity to the unfamiliar possibilities black strangers voice by showing her that she can enlarge her circle of concern and indeed that she should do so. The other is that the other is that the astonishing unfamiliarity of natural beauty can enhance despairing black agents receptivity to the remote possibility of subverting racial, pressure, racial oppression by showing them that they themselves can transform their social world. The two ideas that link these theses and that run through Du Bois's defense of aesthetic education are first, that human agency enjoys the destabilizing power to renovate our moral and, and institutional lives, a power that Roberto Unger echoing uh, John Keats calls negative capability. And second, that beauty is a pedagogical force that can activate that power. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you to both of our speakers. I'll be delivering some brief comments and then I'll be moderating the conversation. So, so please do use the raise hand feature to uh, indicate that you'd like to participate. Uh, over a century ago in 1907, William James took up all the questions this conference has set for itself in an address he gave to the Association of Collegiate Alumni, a, a predecessor of the AAUW. His topic was the uh, social function of the college bread, and the address was published in McClure's in the following year. What's especially taught in the colleges, he says, has long been known by the name of the humanities. And the humanities, he explains, are little more than an appreciative chronicle of human masterstrokes. I admit to a lingering fondness for this definition, but a disinterested survey of the present state of the humanities would show that every show, element, show that every, uh, every element, every in, element in, is contested. Is contested and rightly so. Humanistic study needn't be a chronicle. 
It needn't be appreciative. It needn't be concerned with master strokes. And at least the immediate objects of its concern needn't be human. So we might reflect humanistically on the significance of animal suffering or on the value of a proof or poem produced by a computer. It's fair to wonder then whether we can look to James for help with the main questions of the conference or with the more particular questions about art, democracy, and the cultivation of judgment raised by the inspiring papers we've heard this morning. I think we can make use of James. I've om omitted some important words that he adds to the account of the humanities that I've quoted. The humanities, he says, are, and this is a quotation, little more than an appreciative chronicle of human master strokes so far as it takes the form of criticism and history. I think it's the form of criticism and history, self-consciously assumed, with criticism understood in the broadest possible way, so as to cover any disciplined reflection on the meaning, significance, or value of the object of concern, that's the crucial thing. If the humanities are so understood, I think that their practice is virtually inevitable, at least for reflective creatures, for reasons brought out by Aristotle in an old argument he gave for the inevitability of philosophy. It appears in a lost work of which we have only fragments, the Protrepticus or exhortation, that is exhortation to philosophy. Uh, I quote from a recent reconstruction. If you should do philosophy, you should do philosophy. And if you, sh you should not do philosophy, then you should do philosophy. Why the latter? Because the judgment that we shouldn't do philosophy obliges us to investigate why we shouldn't. And by investigating that, Aristotle replies, we would be doing philosophy. Adapted to the wider case of the humanities, the argument is equally compelling. Either we should practice the kind of criticism or history I've described, or we shouldn't. If we should, then we should, and if we shouldn't, then once again we should, in order to assess the meaning, significance, or value of this particular should not. A should not that seemed at first antagonistic to humanistic reflection, but proves in virtue of the argument to be an occasion for it. Many of you will now be thinking that while this argument may show that there will always be an opportunity for the humanities, it falls short of showing that there will always be a need for them and very far short of showing that the humanities should be a profession, that they should be taught, that the practice and, and that the practice and the teaching of the humanities should be supported not by the market or not only by the market, but by public funds and private fortunes. Fair enough. The only response I can offer now is that there's another inevitability to be contended with, the inevitability of value judgment. Value judgments will be made and made by everyone, whether or not they result from the disciplined practice of criticism and history. So we're faced, as Hume once put it, with a question concerning the course, the choice of our guide. Should it be humanistic practice or should it be something else? We can call this a question of enlightenment. It's a question touched on by James later in the address I've mentioned, but I think I'll pass over my remarks about that in the interest of time. I'll be raising some large questions about the democratic bearing of the arts and the humanities as I conclude. Before that, I'd like to raise one or two more specific questions about our two papers. The nature and power of beauty is a central theme in Professor Gooding Williams's paper, but that theme plays no role, or so it seems to me, in Professor Blake's. Professor Gooding Williams explains that in Du Bois's view, an event, I'm quoting now from Professor Gooding Williams, an event, a natural occurrence, a work of art, a religious vision, or a life, counts as beautiful just in case it comes to a fitting end like the end of a good story, for example, that casts the event itself in an unfamiliar, astonishing light, in a strange light. So for Du Bois, beauty seems to be a kind of fitness, a fitness that astonishes. This understanding, as Professor Gooding emphasizes, applies in Du Bois's view to both artistic beauty and natural beauty. The two kinds of beauty differ though in the paths along which their influence travels. Artistic beauty, Professor Gooding Williams explains, attacks or can attack racial oppression directly. Its targets are habits of mind so entrenched that science, logic, or humanistic reflection can't dislodge them. 
They lie beyond enlightenment, and yet beauty, in Du Bois's view, can reach them. Art has the power, and here I'm quoting Professor Gooding Williams again, to transform, to disintegrate the Christian white supremacist self-understanding by disclosing, disclosing to her, to her astonishment, that her circle of concern properly comprehends Black lives and voices. Natural beauty, by contrast, targets racial oppression indirectly. Quoting again, it relieves Blacks of their tendency to despair, to despair of and quit the struggle by disclosing to them, to their astonishment, that their social world comprehends and hasn't foreclosed the prospect of action that subverts racial oppression. This is a powerful picture, but I'm uncertain why the two kinds of beauty should be so separate in their influence. In Of Beauty and Death, a chapter of Dark Water, Du Bois describes a dinner he attended in Paris. This is a quote from that chapter. A table of gentle women and gentle men, soft-spoken, sweet-tempered, and full of human sympathy, who made me, a stranger, one of them. Ours was a fellowship of common books, common knowledge, and mighty aims. Du Bois, it seems to me, regards this dinner as a thing of beauty. It may be offered to us, I mean, offered to us by him as an image in the small of the crowd so movingly and persuasively described by Professor Gooding Williams, a coming together of strangers marked by receptivity to the unfamiliar and its possibilities. Why wouldn't this instance of social, and therefore I'm imagining non-natural beauty, do as much to relieve the strains of commitment to a morally urgent cause as the contemplation of Mount Desert Island or Loch Katrine. In his essays on the blurring of art and life, Alan Capro hardly touches on beauty, and it doesn't seem to have a role in Professor Blake's absorbing narrative of Capro's restless search for artistic and personal satisfaction. But Capro does make a very interesting remark about beauty as Du Bois understands it, a remark that is about a fitness that astonishes. The remark comes in the 1966 from manifesto from which Professor Blake has quoted. Paul Valéry, Capro writes, suggests, and now I'm quoting Capro, suggests that even if Plato and Spinoza can be refuted, their thoughts remain astonishing works of art. Now as art becomes less art, it takes on philosophy's early role as a critique of life. Even if its beauty can be refuted, it remains astonishingly thoughtful. In the closing paragraphs of, our, of, of Beauty and Death, Du Bois writes that beauty must be complete. Whether it be a field of poppies or a great life, it must end. And the end is part and triumph of the beauty. Capro is in effect asking whether completion, completion that's, that, that completion that's astonishingly, astonishingly fitting once it takes place, though utterly unexpected and unpredictable beforehand, is unique to beauty. Might completion so understood be no less characteristic of truth or of goodness? This possibility leaves me with questions for both of our speakers. For Professor Blake, is the notion of astonishing fitness or completion of any use in understanding Capro's progress as an artist, his resolute blurring of boundaries, um, among them the boundary between art and humanistic reflection upon art. Upon art. Astonishing completeness is actually characteristic of what Dewey calls consummatory experience, of which art, according to Dewey, is, um, is an example. And for Professor Gooding Williams, at various points in an essay, uh, Criteria for Negro Art, published a few years after Dark Water, Du Bois seems to subordinate truth and goodness to beauty. Is that what he intends? And if so, what should we make of it? I return at last to democracy and its relation to the arts and the humanities. Here I'll have to settle for making a few distinctions, a prerequisite I point out with Capro in mind for the blurring of distinctions and raising some straightforward questions on the basis of them. I'll have to put aside the question of what democracy is and point out instead that it can be found or not found at different levels, in the state most obviously, in a workplace, in a school, in a community of scholars or artists, in an ongoing collaboration, or in a conversation. 
This prepares us to ask whether humanistic reflection at whatever level we care to specify is essentially democratic, and if so, in what ways? Or we can ask whether democracy at the level specified promotes human reflection, even if it's not essential to it. Humanistic reflection, I'm sorry, even if it's not essential to it. I think Professor Blake on Capro's behalf and Professor Gooding Williams on Du Bois's behalf speak powerfully in favor of yes answers at particular levels to that question. We can ask corresponding questions about art, though here we may want to distinguish over Capro's objections between its creation and its reception. Is art essentially democratic? If not, does, this, does democracy nonetheless a, a promote art? In all the questions I've asked so far, democracy has been the constitutive or causal factor, but now we can reverse things. We can ask whether art or humanistic reflection is essential to democracy and whether art or humanistic reflection, though perhaps not essential to democracy, promotes it or can promote it. These are large and forbiddingly abstract questions. I hope the vivid portraits painted by our speakers, one of an avowedly political artist and humanist, and one of an apparently non-political artist and humanist will help us to address them. So please do raise your electronic hand if you'd like to um, raise a question or make a comment. I'm not seeing any hands. So in the absence of hands, I might ask Professor Blake or Professor Gooding Williams if they'd like res to respond to anything I've said or anything the other has said. Um, do you want to I should respond? Would you like to, should I start? Yeah. Okay. So um, I can respond very um, uh, uh, brief, briefly uh, to uh, Professor uh, Winkler's uh, uh, comments, um, just very briefly. So, uh, you know, it's, so I think you're absolutely right um, with respect to what's going on there in uh, in Paris. Uh, I'll, I'll say just a couple of things about, you know, you might you might call Du Bois's phenomenology of the crowd. First, that when he's it, that the interest in natural beauty, I think, is prompted by uh, the experience of circumstances where the culture of the mob kind of has, 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 has trumped the culture of the crowd. Uh, uh, it's striking that, it, that, that, that when he goes to, that, that when he's in Europe um, uh, and in Paris, uh, that, that at least one of those patches, pas passages concludes with the boys saying something to the effect that, uh, you know, America needs to kind of uh, uh, learn something about, about democracy, um, uh, bring home, if you will, the democracy of, uh, of Europe. Um, but that said, I think there's much more to be said uh, uh, than I do justice to. Um, I, I, I don't mean to be dismissing or setting aside the, the, the concern there. I think there's much more to be said about the relationship between the turn to natural beauty and uh, what Du Bois has to say about uh, the crowd or the culture of the crowd. Um, and I think one point of departure uh, for thinking about that is actually an essay by James. There's an essay entitled um, on uh, a, certain, uh, a certain blindness in, in human beings in which uh, James uh, uh, famously said that, uh, uh, or says that uh, uh, Whitman uh, 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 felt uh, uh, the crowd as rapturous, rapturously as uh, Wordsworth felt, uh, felt the mountains. And, you know, upon recently rereading that essay, it struck me that there's much going on in the uh, uh, essay on beauty and death that can be read as, as if you will be in dialogue with with that James, uh, 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 with that James uh, uh, essay, not only the discussion of natural beauty, but also, also you know, he quotes you know at length from Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, uh, but much of what he says about the experience of natural beauty, I think, resonates with uh, what I've argued elsewhere is going on when Du Bois is sort of contemplating, thinking about his experience of uh, uh, of natural beauty uh, when he's visiting Jamaica, you know, the sunset at at Montego Bay. And last, yes, you're absolutely right. Criteria of Negro art is absolutely crucial. What I think is going on there roughly is this, that I think Du Bois thinks that the imaginative artist uh, 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 uses truth uh, uh, and uses uh, 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 beauty in the first case to expand uh, our cognitive horizons, in the second place to expand our moral or ethical 
horizons that the imaginative artist um, uses truth uh, uh, or, or if you will, represents truth as beautiful and by doing so expands our cognitive horizons and represents truth as, uh, excuse me, represents moral goodness as beautiful and by so doing um, uh, expands our, our moral uh, horizons, our, our conception of, of, of moral goodness and the demands of moral goodness. So I'll stop there. Um, so if I may respond to Ken's uh, very thoughtful and, and generous remarks, um, or at least try to, they are in fact remarks that raise, as he puts it, large and forbidding questions. Um, I guess I would say that beauty as such is not an important word in Capro's lexicon. You know, it, it appears almost in passing in that manifesto, although that is an important sentence doesn't appear very often in his other writing, as far as I can remember. Um, but I think that your characterization of uh, beauty as Du Bois understands it, um, as um, a fitness that astonishes, um, applies nicely to how Capra thought of art as experience, right? That, that art had the capacity to train people in a fitness um, that astonishes, or rather trains them in the capacity for astonishment, right? Um, so, you know, there, there does seem to me to be a way in which even without the concept of beauty, he had concerns that are consonant with the ones you raise here. I am, I have to think more about the issue of completion because of course, one way of reading what he was up to um, was the creation of almost open-ended uh, works, uh, even if they did have in many cases a timed beginning and end. But your reference to Dewey's idea of consummatory experience, I think is relevant as a way of thinking about where Capra ended up at the, end, at, at the end of his career. Um, and, you know, consummatory experience is also a way of thinking about what Dewey was interested in in his brief and not altogether satisfying book on religion. Um, so there is a way I think that by the end of his life when Capra was to some extent um, making a Zen turn or giving Dewey a sort of Zen emphasis uh, is interested in consummatory experience. Um, as to the, you know, the, the big question about art and democracy, um, it, perhaps it is interesting to look at Capro through a Du Boisian lens. And here I'm using the, the lens that, that Bob has so uh, brilliantly expounded in his paper. Um, I, I don't think anyone can say that art is essentially democratic or that democracy somehow of necessity or in a causal way promotes art. Obviously the issues are more complex than all of that. Um, but if I understand Bob correctly, uh, Du Bois believed that justice demanded epistemic diversity and situated knowledge. This seems to me what Capra was trying to encourage with his experimental art. Um, and in that regard, there is a, a kind of consonance uh, between what he was up to and what I think Du Bois understood um, by beauty and by aesthetic education. Moreover, the idea uh, in Du Bois's work of receptivity to the unfamiliar um, and the possible that is enabled in, by aesthetic education in the culture of the crowd. Um, this seems to me, you know, something that one can um, extrapolate from Capra's work. So that if he was not explicitly a political thinker, which I don't think he was, uh, Dewey's politics didn't register really in his reading of Dewey. Um, there is a way that by implication, uh, pairing him with Du Bois, you can think of his work as having political or democratic consequences. Are there others who'd like to, uh, yes, David Bromwich. 
This is uh, a, a question uh, for Professor Gooding Williams, and it concerns uh, the the use of the word of the words uh, mob and crowd in the writings by Du Bois that he uh, was covering in his talk. Um, you, you know, <laughs> in a loose politicized way, of course, uh, mob is the pejorative word and crowd is the nice word, um, just as riot is the ugly word and um, uprising is the nice word. Um, but it's clear that Du Bois, who is a thinker, means something more interesting than that. Um, and I'm wondering, so I, I throw out a suggestion and I ask you to comment on it from Du Bois' point of view or from your point of view. Um, is it the case that we should, should we think of, a, of the mob as a, as a group of people who uh, gather together almost spontaneously for one purpose, the purpose is destructive or it is an assertion of pure will by that collectivity, the mob. And then the persons in that group, the mob, will have nothing necessarily to do with each other ever after. They have no connection of thought or feeling. Whereas with the crowd, um, there are people gathered perhaps for no particular purpose, though they may be unified behind a purpose once they see each other as a crowd, um, and about whom it's conceivable that they might get together again because there's some sort of recognition that has gone on among them. Is that along the lines uh, that you think Du Bois was making the distinction or, or what? Unmute. Um, no, I think that that's uh, uh, everything you say is 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 is, is pertinent. Um, so as you know, I mean the literature, as 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 I've given versions of this of, of this talk, you know, to different audiences and talk talk talked about the, its arguments to various colleagues. You know, I, I become you know ever more aware of the of, of of the of the of the huge literature on 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 mobs and crowds in the you know in the, the beginning in the late nineteenth in the late nineteenth. Century, but but uh, it was recently in that connection reading reading Canetti. But and 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 in, in any event, it seems to me that um, part of what you're pointing to is what we might think of as the episodic, you know, character of a mob behavior. So the mob is all together; they're focused on a particular end. They act to realize that end, and then they disperse. And who knows if they ever come together again? Whereas you're thinking of the of 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 of, of of, of the crowd as something that has kind of more stability, greater stability, uh, 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 something as, as maybe a formation that that endures over time. Something, so, you know, something like something like, like like that. Um, I think that's on. I think that's on target. The only, but 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 I do believe, and and here's here's what that way of thinking about things does not quite capture, and that's that I think Du Bois wants to use the figure of the mob. Uh, to uh, capture something about a, 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 a culture writ, war, a writ, writ large. So the way I was the way I was presenting the argument, um, I was reading Du Bois. I am reading Du Bois as wanting to describe white Christian culture as a culture of the mob. And by the way, just to be clear about that, in other places I explain that notion of white Christian culture. But the but the idea is that is that um, you know Du Bois thinks that white Christians have a misunderstanding of what Christianity is. What what it requires of them, and that being a Christian is consistent with, uh, uh, say, being a racist. And part of the point, part of what he thinks a certain kind of art can do is that it can um, challenge that conception of, of, of what Christianity is, what moral goodness is, what it requires uh, of them. But, 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 but I add that information just uh, about, about the larger argument, just to, again, point to the idea that, that uh, uh, what Du Bois has in mind vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the figure of the mob is not just episodic acts of lynching, for example, but a, 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 a wider, broader cultural tendency, which makes the, 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 the use of mob and the use of uh, crowd perhaps seem less asymmetrical than it might seem if you think it's one, one is episodic and one is getting at something more enduring. I think that for Du Bois, yes, obviously, you know, the episodic thing matters. He's, you know, lynching is all over the place in dark water, but he's, he's thinking of that as, 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 as representative of, of a larger cultural sensibility. I'm I think afraid. Michael Freed had his hand up. Please.
Michael Fried? I think he's uh, muted. I think you're muted, Professor Fried. Yeah, I, I, I didn't have my hand up. Okay, oh. all right. Well, we, I've been told in fact that we, we need to conclude. So um, um, uh, a, a reminder that we'll pick up again at one o'clock uh, uh, for Michael Kloon's talk. You're, you're free to stay on with your video and audio muted. Uh, 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 until then, but if not, please return at one for um, um, the next event. Thank you all, and thanks especially to our speakers.